Hello and welcome to this edition of the Oaks Church Worship Online. We are so grateful that you are joining us here this morning. And during this time, we are providing these services online while we reacclimate to our public gatherings. So what you're going to be watching today is the sermon and the service from last week. And so what we're doing is we are recording the service live on Sundays, and then we are posting that service and sermon the following Sunday. So if you're watching this service, know that it was uh, that actually took place a week ago. And so know that if you are a part of our church and if you're a part of our missional communities, then you may be a week behind on some of these if you are not coming to our in-person gatherings. Uh, but we want you to know that we are so grateful that you are joining us this morning. And so we know that the online experience is not ultimately what we hope for, but we know that it is very important to offer because there are so many of you who still need an online option for this time as we figure out what it means for us to even meet again. So we are so grateful that you're joining us and we hope to see you again sometime soon. Hope you enjoy the service. Enjoy. The uh, scripture reading for today is from uh, the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 4, verse 12. And God's word says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the grace you have shown every one of us here in gathering us here today to worship you. Thank you for your word, for it is true life, opening our eyes to see you for who you are and what you have done and continue to do for us. For you always have been and always will be living and active. Fix our gaze on you, God, as we give everyone and everything in our lives to you, for you are infinitely better. I pray you pierce our hearts with your word and reveal to us the thoughts and intentions which do not line up with who you are and who you declared us to be. And I pray that you just cut them out, Lord. Renovate our hearts every moment, God. Help us to recognize you alone are our supreme satisfaction so we may love you and our neighbors better, all to the glory of your awesome name. In Jesus' name I pray. Good afternoon. Let's try that again. Good afternoon, Oaks Church. It is great to be with you guys for our second Sunday of getting to meet in person. I just love being able to worship with you guys again. If you have your Bible, go ahead and find Psalm 131. That's where we're going to be spending our time. If you're new to the scriptures, then Psalms is right in the middle of your Bible. So if you just flip open to the middle, you'll see kind of a big numbered heading, and as you flip through, find the one that says 131. That's where we're going to be this morning. We're going to be talking about the joy, about the ability to have a calm and quiet soul this morning. What it means to walk with the Lord in a way that your soul can be calm and quiet. And so if you'll turn to Psalm 131, that is where we are going to spend our time this afternoon. About seven years ago, Abby, my wife, and I, we had just moved to Louisville, Kentucky. We were newly married. We had new jobs. We were in a new city, a new state. Everything was different. We were about 13 hours from home. And for the first time, I found myself 
with a lot of new responsibilities. I was a new husband, and admittedly, I had no idea what I was doing. I had a lot of worries. There were a lot of things that I just didn't understand. And during that first year, for the first time in my life, I knew what it was like to lead a family and the weight that that meant to carry. And during that time in Louisville, Abby began to experience some unexplainable chest pain. I remember one night in particular, as we were having a conversation, we were standing there in the second story of our apartment, and in mid-conversation, she paused to say, I think that something just doesn't feel right, and she felt her way to the edge of our bed, and in mid-sentence, she collapsed, she fainted, and at that moment, all of my worst fears were unraveling right before my eyes. I saw my wife, I shouted her name, I squeezed her shoulders, and for the longest 10 seconds of my life, she didn't respond, she didn't move. I was terrified. Then she came to, she woke up, so I helped her down the stairs of our apartment, and we got to the nearest emergency room. I was frantic, to say the least. I mean, we rushed in, and I explained the situation. Uh, Immediately, they took her heart rate, and they discovered that her heart rate was racing nearly 200 beats per minute. It's like her heart thought that she was running a marathon, even though she hadn't done anything active. X-rays, EKGs, a wearable heart monitor later, and they diagnosed her with something called sinus tachycardia, which we all have, but for some reason her heart was moving rapidly, even though there was no reason for it. Now, by God's grace, since that time, we've only had a couple episodes. It's been years since anything like that has happened again, but when I think back to that night, I think about the hospital staff that surrounded us. They carried themselves with what I could only explain as a humble confidence. They were calm. Me, on the other hand, I was was panicked. I was frantic. I was scatterbrained. I was anxious. I was stressed out and helpless. But when we rushed into the waiting room, each person that we encountered was a non-anxious presence to us. They were bringing order into the middle of our chaos. They were composed. They weren't dull, they weren't dismissive of our reality, but they had a sense of humble sanity that was assuring to us. Well, whenever we get to Psalm 131, David invites us as Christians to learn that kind of life. He offers a calm and quiet soul. David doesn't deny the storms of life, and yet he claims that the Christian can know the quiet calm of spiritually resting in Jesus when a hurricane is raging around you. And we need this. Now, while I know that most of you didn't take a trip to your nearest emergency room this weekend, you know what it is like to wrestle with anxiety. You know what it is like to worry about the future, to wrestle with sin and regret from your past. Is your soul quiet or is your soul noisy this afternoon? If I'm honest and just kind of look through the past few months of our life, our life as a church, there were times my soul was very noisy. I wasn't calm. I wasn't quiet. I was frantically searching for a place for our church to meet. And God blessed us through Christ the King with the ability to meet here. I was frantically searching through through ways, people that would speak into my life and help us to lead our church. And what I found is that a calm and quiet soul comes from the presence of God. Maybe you need a calm and quiet soul. Maybe you think about someone that you love. It seems that they are out at sea today, getting pummeled by the waves of confusion and fear. What hope do you have for them? How do we access the calm and quiet soul that David has in Psalm 131? Well, he's going to teach us that this calm and quiet soul can't be found on a map. We have to be led there. Having a calm and quiet soul isn't the result of Prozac or practicing better habits. It comes from a relationship with Jesus that reorients our own self-reliance and calms our anxiety. I want you to look to Jesus for just a moment. Is there a better picture of a calm and quiet soul? Jesus is unhurried. You read through the Gospels, he's compassionate, he's calculated, He has the humble confidence of walking in step with the Father. Now, can you imagine how unsettling it would be to read the Gospels and to read of an anxious, stressed out Jesus? But he never was. I mean, if you look at his life, you just read the first few chapters of the Gospel of Mark, you see that he pulled away in the morning to spend hours with the Father in prayer. 
uh, you see that he paused for the crippled and the possessed. That The disciples were often confused by this. There's a story where Jesus is on his way to heal Jairus' daughter, and they ran up to her, Jairus, a leader, and he says, my, my daughter is on the point of death. And so Jesus, as it run there, he begins to walk toward Jairus' house to heal his daughter. And while he's on the way there, what happens? A woman touches him, and so he stops, right? The disciples are like, come on, Jesus, let's do this, All right, we got stuff to do. And he stops, and he says, who touched me? And then they're like, Jesus, what's, I mean, we're in a crowd, right? There's this little girl who's about to flatline, and you're worried about who touched your shirt. What's going on? And yet Jesus stops. He speaks to this broken woman. He heals her. And then he continues. Her life forever changed. He continues, gets to the door of the house that Jairus' daughter is in, and somebody comes out. Don't bother. The little girl is dead. You didn't make it in time. And yet Jesus isn't anxious. He replies, she's just sleeping. He dismisses everyone from the room but her parents and speaks into this girl's ear, Talitha Kumi. Wake up, little girl. The Lord, the author of life, owner of everything, unhurried, moment by moment, breathing what is a calm and quiet soul into the life of those around him. And what happens? Her heart beats and her eyes open, Jesus walked with a quiet confidence as God in the flesh. And David's invitation in this psalm is not ultimately be like Jesus, although that is worthy of our striving. We should aim to be like Jesus. I I think what David is going to invite us to in Psalm 131 is to be with Jesus. You see, although David wrote about 1,000 years before Jesus came to earth, David invites us to enter God's presence which is ultimately fulfilled in the story of Jesus as the Bible unfolds. You see, a calm and quiet soul is learned by walking in the awareness of God's presence. Jesus teaches us, or rather disciples us into this humble confidence of walking with Him. Jesus rescues us from our own self-reliance and instability and invites us to come to him. We frantically rush into the throne room of Christ and he greets us like an all-knowing and compassionate doctor who not only knows the cure but became the cure himself after taking upon himself our disease. You see, the calm and quiet soul is breathed into the believer through the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit lives in us to produce the calm and quiet of walking with Jesus. And as we abide in Him, we abound in peace. So if you're here this morning, and you want to know how to have a calm and quiet soul, what is this composure, contentment, and humble sanity? It is the mark of those who cling to Jesus. And so as we look at this passage, my main point for you this morning is only the Lord can calm our hearts and quiet our souls. Only the Lord can calm our hearts and quiet our souls. Read Psalm 131 with me. It says, A song of ascents of David. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. This psalm has become extremely life-changing for Abby and I, and so whenever I knew I had the opportunity to preach the psalms this summer, this is a psalm that I knew I wanted to teach to you for your encouragement and building up as well. Now, as we say every week that we've been in the Psalms, it's important to understand the occasion of the Psalm before we get into the application of the Psalm. And so why is this Psalm being written? Well, we see right here at the very beginning that it is a song of ascent, a song of David. So David wrote this Psalm. And it's a Psalm of ascent, which means it is one of the songs that Israel sang as they climbed up the mountain to Jerusalem three times a year for one of their religious pilgrimages. Now, David is saying that he learned to calm and quiet his soul in the presence of God. Now, if you remember David's path to becoming king, you know it was a difficult one. He was anointed as king and yet had to wait 10 years for that promise to come to pass. He was being chased by King Saul who sought to kill him. 
David had reasons to complain. He could have been consumed with worry. And what does he do? He trusts God. He had the humble confidence that God knew better than he did in the midst of his trial. He purposed to rest in the Lord. So as we come to Psalm 131, isn't it a gift that this prayer didn't stay tucked away in David's journal, but that the Holy Spirit inspired that we would have this as a guide to experiencing the presence of God in everyday life. So as we come to Psalm 131, we want to listen carefully. And the first thing I want to lift out of this psalm for you is two obstacles to a calm and quiet soul. These two obstacles, the first one is the obstacle of pride. Look at what he says. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. Now David begins this psalm by speaking to the Lord. In this song, David is sharing his experience with God. It's almost like we're getting to have a moment of holy eavesdropping on the way that he prays with the Lord and the relationship they have. He wants us to understand that calm and contentment can't be found anywhere else. And so David knows that one of the greatest obstacles to enjoying the presence of God is ourselves. It's our own pride. And David expressed humility in the way that he begins this psalm. He says, Lord. I want you to understand that Lord is not just simply a title. As he calls on the Lord, he is expressing both surrender to God humility before God, and worship in the face of God. He begins this prayer with two statements that communicate the same thing. He says, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. Well, what does this mean? It's an idiom in Hebrew. It's kind of like um, us saying, you know, I don't think that I'm all that in a bag of chips or like whatever it is that communicates pride in our culture. That's what he's saying here. He's like, my, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not fixed too high. Hi, I'm not going to be prideful. I'm not going to think too much of myself. I'm not going to look down on other people. And he makes it a matter of prayer. Now, why was pride a matter of prayer? Well, I think to understand that, we need to understand what pride is and the way that pride causes us to view God. You see, pride is such a big deal because it elevates our view of self and it makes us have a small view of God. It makes us have an insignificant view of others. It makes us believe that our needs, preferences, wants, desires, possessions, accomplishments, etc. are more important than anything else. To put it in another way, pride is functional atheism. What do I mean by that? I mean that whenever we are prideful, we live like God doesn't exist. We act like others don't bear His image. We choose our own desires instead of His commands. We focus on our problems instead of the promises of God. We become like our first parents in the Garden of Eden who take the forbidden fruit because we act like we know better than He does. And the opposite of pride is humility. As I've heard one pastor say before, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself Less. We want to be humble people. Tim Keller says that pride is, is the illusion that we are competent to run our own lives, to achieve our own sense of self-worth, and to find a purpose big enough to give us meaning in life without God. And so to have a calm and quiet soul, we have to have a correct view of ourselves. I want to plead with you just how dangerous pride is. Take it from a guy who's experienced the brunt of it firsthand. When we think of ourselves too highly, we become so vulnerable to the temptation of Satan. We can become so vulnerable to our own flesh. We begin to think things like, I don't need to pray before I lead missional community group tonight. I do this every single week. We think things like, you know, I've got this addiction under control. Honestly, I wouldn't even call it that, right? I could stop looking at that anytime I want. I could, I could stop indulging in that habit anytime I want. Pride is so dangerous. It lies to us. It's deceitful. It makes us ignore the word of caution from our brothers and sisters. We say, I'm not going to listen to them whenever they point out my faults, my sin. I mean, I know more of the Bible than they do. Pride is so dangerous. Now, let me explain it to you with an analogy. See, I don't have a fear of flying personally, but I would have a fear of flying if I was to board a plane and get in the wrong seat. You see, it is good to know that whenever I board an airplane, I belong in the cabin, not in the cockpit. 
It wouldn't be good for me or for anyone else if I forgot my seating assignment and some, for some reason took the pilot's seat in that airplane because that is not where I belong. I want you to see that as Christians, we must remember our seat assignment in life because we belong in the cabin and God belongs in the cockpit. You see, pride will always seek to put us in the place that God belongs, and when we do that, our lives will crash and burn. So how do we know if we are prideful? How do we know if our hearts lifted up too high? How do I know if my eyes are lifted too high? See, the difficult thing about being prideful is that most of us don't know when we're doing it. It's like whenever you get that screen time report on your iPhone each week, and you don't think that you've spent that much time on it, and you're like, what? Hours? How? You know? Or you think you're eating something really healthy like craisins. This was my life like a couple weeks ago, and it's like 22 grams of sugar and a third of a cup, and it's like trail mix is killing me, you know? So, so it's like, I don't, that wasn't in here, but all I'm saying is we need to be able to assess our pride, and you can't change what you don't know. So you could be struggling with pride if you're 24 things, here we go, I'm going to give them to you quick. If you're desiring to be recognized and appreciated, you don't have to write all these down, I'll give them to you in the weekly email. If you're feeling hurt when others are promoted and you feel overlooked. If you're viewing other people as competitors instead of companions. If you're focusing on yourself rather than others, you could be prideful if you're quick to blame others for their failures. If you use double standards to look at your own faults or mistakes in comparison to the faults of others. If you become defensive when criticized. If you're concerned with what others will think about you. If you have difficulty in admitting when you have failed another person. If you view others lower than yourself. If you lack compassion for others, you're prideful. If you're desiring for others to meet your needs instead of seeing a problem and seeking to meet the needs of others. If you're desiring self-advancement. If you're desiring to be successful apart from God's blessing or direction. If you refuse to give up your personal rights and preferences. If you refuse to learn from others that have a different situation, upbringing, or past than you do. You're being prideful. If you desire to control others, if you talk more about yourself in a conversation than you ask questions about other people, if you draw attention to your abilities and achievements, if you feel sorry for yourself when you're not recognized or appreciated like you want to, you're still focusing on self, which is prideful. If you're focusing on your knowledge and experience, you're being prideful. If you're needing to be the solution of everyone's problems, or maybe you're taking the blame every time something goes wrong, you're you're being prideful. If you're withholding forgiveness, and finally, if you're feeling self-sufficient with no need for God or others, you're being prideful. Let's add one more to make it 25. If you think nothing in that list applies to you, you're being <laughs> prideful, right? And at different seasons in my life, I've experienced every single one of these, and I'm ashamed to say how many of them I have experienced even this week. So how do we change? We look to Christ. You see, David knew that his only hope for real change and humility was by coming to God. And when we see the majesty, grace, power, and kindness of an almighty God, we stand in awe of who he is. Our pride melts like wax in the heat of the sun. When we stand before God, we must admit that we are without hope and filthy with sin. You see, the gospel confronts our pride and produces humility. Are you proud this morning? Understand that the gospel says you can't do anything to fix yourself. What is more humbling than to realize that your own sin produced the crucifixion of the Son of God? If you're not a Christian yet this morning, let me warn you as a friend. The greatest act of pride that you could ever commit is rejecting Jesus and your need for a Savior. And the most important act of humility that you could ever submit yourself to is admitting that you need a Savior. Have you done that? Christian, when you sin, do you humbly come before God or do you just say, you know what, I can just kind of fix this mess up myself? We are people who look to Jesus. We look at Jesus as the model of humility in Philippians 2, 6 through 7. We see that Jesus being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. You see, perhaps no story displays this better than when Jesus, the king of glory, knelt in the dirt, wearing his, his linen clothes, 
The king of glory steps down with a rag on his shoulder, takes it off and begins to wash the grimy, filthy feet of those who would betray him and deny him in just a couple of days. Humility to come and to cleanse us. Peter says, Lord, don't don't do this. Don't do this. And what Jesus says is, Peter, if you don't humble yourself enough to admit that only I can clean you, then you will have no relationship with me. And then Peter says, well, then clean my hands, clean my feet, clean my head, clean everything. That's humility before Christ. We say like John the Baptist, I must decrease, he must increase. You see, the stars are beautiful in the night sky, but when the sun comes up, they fade into the background. And although we are image bearers of God, when the Son of God comes into our lives, he shines the brightest through us and we fade into the background. May we be a church that is humble. May we see what God is doing in and through our church and be humble people. We're humble that God would use us. We're humble. So what will this look like? It means that we are those who make much of the Lord and everything. Our skills, abilities, our gifts, our growth, everything magnifies Jesus. The second obstacle to a calm and quiet soul is the obstacle of anxiety. See, David says, I do not occupy myself with things that are too great and too marvelous for me. Let's understand two things about King David. First, he had a lot of human power. I mean, think about it. He was ruling a nation. He could begin a war between nations with just his signature. There were people, thousands of people, whose simple job description was, do what King David says. Right? And sometimes I can't even get Siri to listen to me. And David's just like controlling and commanding all of these people. And yet he admits that some things are just too great for him to handle. Second, he had a lot of responsibilities. He was the king. It wasn't like the democratic processes and support systems that we have for leaders now. No, if you were a king in that time, you were the ultimate source of authority in the land. And yet he admits that he knows his own limitations. In this psalm, David is choosing to admit God is in control. He's choosing to reject anxiety. He is trading his worry for trust in the Lord. Look again at verse 1. He says, I do not occupy myself which means he's not dwelling on. He's not just kind of worrying about things that are too great and too marvelous for him. He's saying, I don't fixate on things that are ultimately out of my control. And this is hard for us because whether we admit it or not, we like to be in control. But control is a mirage. If we have learned anything in the past few months, it is that control is an illusion. It's like trying to walk a lion on a leash. It may seem like for a moment you have things under control, but in any instant, something unpredictable and disastrous can happen. You see, we need to be like David and, and say, I'm not going to focus, I'm not going to dwell, I'm not going to fixate on things that are too great for me. Our anxiety... Our our seeking to control or worry about things always reveals our view of God. You see, if you have watched a movie or a documentary, a a sports uh, casting of any kind within the past 50 years, then you've probably benefited from a piece of technology that is called a Steadicam. Some of you that are in the tech industry know about this. And now you've probably seen a camera operator wearing a, a vest. There's an arm that's connected to a camera. It's got weights on it, all of this. Now, they can move, they can walk, they can make quick adjustments while they are recording something, and you would never know it because of this thing that's invented called the Steadicam. You see, it has counterweights that keep the subject in focus regardless of the movements that take place around it. And what I want you to understand is that a stable view of the world is produced by a weighty view of God. Regardless of what is going on through the lens of this camera, these counterweights hold this camera in a way that it is unshaken and stable. And what I want you to see is that when the view of our world may be shifting around us, our view is stable and unshaken because we know that God is always good, that he doesn't tell us things that we don't need to know, and that he is on his throne. David teaches us to view the Lord with a proper perspective. We don't lift our eyes up to things that we shouldn't. No, we lift our eyes up to you, Jesus, who is on your throne. As the psalmist says in Psalm 123, 1, and this produces a calm and quiet soul. Now, you may be wondering this week, because this is a practical question that I had, is all worry, is all, is all worrying sinful? 
I want us to say, no, there is a difference between a godly worry that expresses itself in stewardship and a sinful worry or anxiety. It isn't sinful to wear your seatbelt because you want to be protected in a car crash. It isn't sinful to put money in savings because you want to have money there for a rainy day. No, it becomes sinful when those things become our ultimate source of trust. So when does occupying ourselves with something become sinful? Well, it's whenever something offends God or violates His design. So thinking through that lens, let's sort our spiritual laundry a little bit. We need to ask, is my anxiety sinful? Does it cause me to doubt God's character? Am I anxious because of sin in another area in my life? Maybe you've been anxious before because you know that you sinned a certain way. You're trying to cover it up. You're trying to keep it from happening again. So you're just kind of anxious. And maybe you're anxious because you haven't resolved a relationship issue that God is calling you into. Now, second, our anxiety may not always be from a place of sin, but sometimes it leads into a sinful behavior, which is why we shouldn't occupy ourselves with things that are too great for us. Does, does your anxiety keep you from obedience to God? Does your anxiety cause you to act destructively or to disengage completely? You see, knowing the root of our anxiety helps us in dealing with it. The root matters because you see there are two types of anxiety. There is anxiety that is produced from sin in our lives, and there is anxiety that is produced from suffering in our lives. If you think back to Philippians 4, Paul talks to this church that is anxious, and he says, rejoice and do not be anxious. He's commanding them, do not be anxious. Well, what is the context there? Well, these two ladies were fighting each other in the church. Nobody had addressed it. Things were kind of spiraling out of control. The church was anxious. And what does Paul say? Hey, you need to address the sin. You need to repent and trust God. And so whenever our our anxiety is a result of sin, the action step is to repent and believe. But Anxiety can also come from suffering. If you read through 1 Peter, like we went through earlier this year, uh, you see that, that Peter is writing to this church that's anxious because they're being persecuted in Asia Minor. And what does he say? Cast your anxieties upon the Lord. Well, what is he telling them to do? If your anxiety is a result of sin, the action step is to repent and believe. If your anxiety is the result of suffering, the command is do not be anxious, but rather to trust and believe. Both types of anxiety require us to believe that God is in control and that we can submit to Him. So these are the two obstacles. Now, as we continue through this passage, I want you to see two truths about a calm and quiet soul. The first one is that in the Lord we can have a calm and quieted soul. Look at verse 2. David says, But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. See, David has a humble confidence. His heart, his soul is like a pond that is so still you can see your reflection in it. That is the calm and quiet soul of a Christian. And I want you to understand that David isn't rejecting reality here. He's not ignoring the pressures of the world. He's not decaffeinated in this moment. He's not finishing his second glass of scotch to try to dull his senses. He's not on a beach being retired with his, with his toes in the sand somewhere. No, he believes that this humble confidence of a soul resting in Christ is accessible in everyday life. And what I hope for you, church, is that you would understand the calm and quiet soul that is found in God isn't about letting go of all of your stressors and problems. It is about clinging to the presence of God in the middle of them. You see, Paul knew the peace that David had found. He knew that Jesus was a sure and steady anchor, which is why he tells us to pray where the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And David, as a good preacher, gives us an illustration here. He gives us a picture of what a calmed and quieted soul looks like. He says it looks like a weaned child resting on its mother's lap. He had in mind most likely those babies that would travel those three times a year up the hill to Jerusalem with their mothers. For those of you that are not parents yet, this illustration of a weaned child may not make sense. So let me explain. When a child is weaned, it is adjusted to solid food. And when a child is not weaned, it's still on milk. So, so the way that they begin to tell you what they need, they just communicate by crying. And we have a six-month-old, so we're like living this in the Kirkland house right now. And whenever they're hungry, when they perceive a need, they just cry. 
It doesn't matter if they've eaten before, they know their parents are good. It just all goes out the window. They just scream and cry. And he says, wait, my soul is like a weaned child that trusts. They trust their parents to provide for them and understand that they can be patient because their parents are good. And David says that his soul is like a weaned child. When we feel like we have a need, when there is something in our life that creates a sense of hunger, we can patiently wait upon God because he will meet our needs and he is good. I want you to notice that a weaned child is able to just sit on a mother's lap without worrying. The child is comforted more by being with his mother than what he receives from his mother. And the Christian is the same way. We are more comforted by God being present with us than simply seeking the presence that he can give us. As Deuteronomy 33, 27 puts it well, the eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are his everlasting arms. That's what produces a calm and quiet soul, the presence of God. In this passage, the mother doesn't need to explain that dinner is still in the oven or that dad is on his way home with takeout. No, it is a simple trust that is calm and quiet. And this is a mark of spiritual maturity in us. You see, a spiritual child, with a spiritual child, it is possible to grow old and not grow up. What do I mean by that? It is possible to grow older as a Christian and not grow up in maturity as a Christian. And yet growing in maturity is seen as having a humble confidence in the Lord. I also want you to notice in this analogy that the parent chooses when and how to wean a child. So for every Christian, the when and how of God growing you in spiritual maturity will look different, but you can trust him in it. The second truth about a calm and quiet soul is that we are invited to enjoy a calm and quiet soul in the presence of God. See, at the end of David's prayer, he prays, O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. He lowers his head from heaven in this prayer to speak to the people of Israel. And he desires that this experience with God would be an encouragement to others. It has been for me, and I hope it has been for you. See, when David speaks to Israel, he reminds them of their covenant relationship with God. What was made available to Israel throughout the Old Testament is now available to anyone who would trust in Christ, to every tribe, nation, and tongue. And he is inviting them to hope in the Lord. Don't hope in yourself because that produces pride. Don't hope in your situation because that produces anxiety. No hope in the Lord. See, David embraces a theological truth here. Your past, as he looks from this time forth and forevermore, he's saying, hey, your past doesn't define you. The past mistakes and failures you've made do not confine you to a certain identity. No, you can choose to hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And I don't know what your life has looked like up to this point. But I do know that this passage is for you if you will trust him from August 23rd, 2020 at 148 until you see him face to face from this time forth and forevermore. You see, hoping in the Lord will produce a calm and quieted soul. And hoping in the Lord will make you to where you cannot keep this hope to yourself. As he says, Israel, hope in the Lord. David pleaded with Israel, and we plead with those around us, encouraging our brothers and sisters in Christ to hope in the Lord and engaging a stressed out world that is yet to know Jesus. Imagine how the world would respond if you lived in such a way that you displayed the calm and quiet life of walking with Jesus. The gospel is good news to those who live in a world of turbulence, and we have it to offer as a hope to all those around us. As I close, I want to leave you with four paradoxes of the calm and quiet soul. These could be a sermon in themselves, but they're not going to be, I promise. You see, a paradox is something that seems wrong, perhaps at the moment seems contradictory, but proves to be true. And I want to give these to you to help you tackle pride and anxiety, replace it with a humility and trust that is found in calmly and quietly trusting your soul to Jesus in his presence. First, we are strongest when we admit our weakness. Paul says, your grace is sufficient for me. Whenever we admit our weakness, whenever we are humble before God, we realize the strength of Christ in and through us. So we are strongest when we admit our weakness. Second, we lead best when we follow Jesus. 
You want to be a leader? You want to impact those around you? You want to influence for the kingdom of God? You want to lead? Be a good follower. Fathers, you want to lead your family. Mothers, you want to lead your children. Those of you who serve on teams and workplaces, those of you who are are in areas where you're impacting and influencing others, you want to lead well for the glory of God. Learn to follow Jesus humbly. Third, we are most confident when we surrender control. Imagine that. Whenever we try to control everything, it seems like a million things are spinning out of control. And whenever we humbly believe that Jesus has it all in his hands, that's where we find true confidence. How great is that? Fourth, we view moments of anxiety as opportunities to experience a deeper relationship with God. Instead of getting to moments that that would cause anxiety, that would almost unravel our faith, we see it as an opportunity for God to flex his powerful arm of sovereignty in our lives, and we trust him so that we know a deeper experience of who he is, a deeper understanding of his patience, a deeper understanding of his grace, a deeper understanding of his control, a deeper understanding of his power. These moments of anxiety are opportunities. So as Christians, we know the rest of a calm and quiet soul in the presence of the Lord. We can have that in this room, in an emergency room, anywhere, because we know the calm and quiet soul of walking with Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you uh, for, for your word this afternoon. Lord, we thank you that, that you calm us, you quiet us. Jesus, we're thankful that you're at work in us and through us. Lord, restore us with the gospel. God, I pray if there are those here this afternoon that are relying in self to try to fix themselves, to try to clean themselves up, to try to try to manage their life, Lord, that they would humbly admit they need you. Lord, I pray for those of us who seek to be self-sufficient, who, who view others around us in ways that are inaccurate and distorted. God, that you would correct us. Lord, that as a church, we would be humble in this city and that you would do more than we can ask or think for your name and not ours. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Each week as a church family, uh, we like to take Lord's Supper to reflect on our relationship with God, that he in his grace invites us to his table. Jack, I'm going to ask you to play. I'm going to give you a couple of moments to just calmly and quietly reflect on the presence of God, to enjoy his presence. Now, you can grab the cup and the cracker that is under your seat. If you need to sanitize your hands, that's there for you. You pray, you reflect, and then we'll take the Lord's Supper together. Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, this is Jesus' body crucified for us. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Church, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are reminded of the Lord's death and resurrection until he returns. Would you please stand and worship our King with me? If you would like to pray with one of our pastors, we'll be in the back. We'd love to talk to you about anything and any way we can help you. I count on one thing, the same God that never
never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same god who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name yes i will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days yes i will i count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. And yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name and yes i will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days yes i will and i choose to pray Glorify, glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise to glorify, glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name and yes i will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days yes i will and all my days yes i One of the great things about our services right now is that we have our children with us, and uh, my child doesn't want to go out of my arms, so here's Olivia, everybody. We have, uh, there you go, people are clapping for you. Who are they clapping for? You. Uh, let, let's see, we have just a few announcements before we conclude our services today. You guys all have a fall calendar under your seats or around your seats somewhere, please take that and put it somewhere that you're going to see it regularly. Uh, that way you can keep up with what's going on in the life of our church. Please know that we have a few things coming up here in the next few weeks. On the 12th, we have a sports Saturday at Summit Park in the morning from about 10 to 12, and we'll grab lunch right after. And then we have our starting point class on Sunday the 13th. So if you're not a member here at the Oaks or you just want to know a little bit more about the history of our church, where we got started and what led us to the point that we're at now, that's a great class for you to get involved. And so uh, we're going to host that on September the 13th. You won't want to miss that. And uh, we will now read from Romans chapter 16 as we conclude our services God's word says this, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Oaks Church, you are sent. Have a great Sunday.
We are so very grateful that you have chosen to join us in worshiping the Lord this morning. And I want you to know that we want to connect with you in the best way possible. So if you are new to the Oaks Church, we would love for you to go to the homepage of our website. There you can fill out a short form just letting us know that you joined us today and letting us know how we can best follow up with you and get you connected in the life of our church. If you are a part of our congregation, know that there's also a form that you can fill out on the homepage of our website where you can let us know what's going on in your life. You can let the elders of the church know how we can be praying for you and what things we can be lifting up to the Lord for you this very week. We hope that you'll go to the homepage of our website there and fill out those forms. Also on our website, you can join us in the mission of our church by giving online. We would love uh, if you would just continue your generosity through this time, uh, knowing that the Lord wants more for us than he wants from us. And uh, we are grateful to partner with you as we seek to reach our city with the gospel, as we seek to bring restoration through the gospel to Cincinnati and the world. Well, we're so grateful that you've joined us today, and we truly do look forward to seeing you soon. But until then, Oaks Church, you are sent. We'll see you soon.